Hi guys. Hi. 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 Good. Can yeah, I offend somebody? I know. But I do sometimes, I go to the back of the room and <laughs> speak from there. <laughs> Done that before. So glad you could be here. Uh, I'm Joe Esposito, and what we're going to talk about today, how many people listen on radio? Oh, yeah. Just me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so we're going to talk today about mental health. And this is a biggie uh, because it's somewhere, it depends on the statistics, you're 11 million people are affected by it. And that's the people that are actually diagnosed. That's not counting the people that are affected by it every day. Now, all of us have some type of issues when it comes to emotions. We'll get sad. We'll get depressed. Uh, number one cause of stress. Number one uh, cause of stress and depression. What do you think it is? Among people, money. Money. Death. Death of a loved one. Yes. Death of a loved one is number one. What do you think number two is? Moving. Isn't that wild? So that's not just moving from a new house to a new house, new job, new relationship. So moving is the number two stress. We're, we're kind of creatures of habit. Most of us like to have things the way they always were. And when you move, it's a lot of stress. So if you have both together, you've got a big issue. And the good news is that you can get over that. None of this is going to be permanent. A friend of mine called me the other day and she said, I'm just having a miserable week. I needed to hear your voice. And I said, okay, what's going on? And she says, I don't know. <laughs> Job is great, happy at home, everything's wonderful, I'm depressed. What do you think it is? So we went through kind of what I'm going to talk about tonight, and in about 10 or 15 minutes she went, well that makes sense, I can do that. And she went ahead and did it, a couple of days later she called me back and she goes, you were right. Because if you understand how something works, it's easy to fix. And we understand how the brain works, it's a lot easier to fix. And for years, we, we, we didn't know what to do with it. We'd give medication. Now, medica I'm not against medication. Medication is okay. In a, in a serious situation, pain, depression, medication can be great. But my thing that I want to get the, my point across is I want you to understand we want to get to the cause of the problem, not just treat the symptoms. It's okay to treat the symptoms, but you also want to get to the cause. Okay? So let's talk about the brain and how the brain works. The brain needs three things. If the brain gets these three things, it's going to function much better than it is when it's not getting those three things. Those three things. Oxygen, stimulation, and nutrition. That's it. That's all your brain needs. Oxygen, stimulation, and nutrition. And one of the problems is we don't give it a lot of anything in many cases. Any of those three. Oxygen is how we what? We breathe, right? We gotta breathe. Most people don't breathe properly. And that sound weird? But when you breathe, your diaphragm drops down. Your diaphragm is a sheet of muscle right here. It's gonna come back later. Remember diaphragm. It sits here, and your lungs are up here. So the way you breathe, the way you get air into your body is your diaphragm drops. When your diaphragm drops, it sucks air in. You make a vacuum. And when you exhale, the diaphragm pushes the air out. And the ribs also can expand and contract and allowing air to suck in. So breathing is mechanical. So we have to make sure the mechanics are working. So what can affect the diaphragm and the ribs? Well, diaphragms are muscles, so it can spasm. If the diaphragm spasms, it's not going to drop, go up and down properly. The ribs, you got a lot of ribs, 12 on either side, 24 ribs. Anybody, well, anybody ever eat ribs? Not human, huh? but I, mean, I hope you never eat human. Don't admit it if you don't. Uh, but ribs, that meat in between the, the bones, that's what you look like. I remember the first time I dissected cadavers, cadavers, yes, they were dead. And, uh, I'm Italian, people have to question that. So, when we cut open the cadavers, the ribs look just like animal ribs. They've got meat and bones on them. It's really kind of a weird feeling going, oh, this looks like ribs. And at the time I ate meat, so it's really kind of weird. And so the muscles are the things, the intercostal muscles expand and contract. And that's how the ribs expand and contract and suck air and blow air out. So you have to have the mechanics. So any of those ribs can twist out of place. When a rib twists out of place, it's going to remove that fluid movement or block that fluid movement, and that can affect breathing. So if you have pain in your mid-back, or your chest, or in your rib area, chances are a rib's out of place. And if a rib's out of place, the only way to fix it is to put it back in place. Make sense? So that's mechanically how we can increase our oxygen levels. If you're having pain, pain is a warning sign. It's telling you something's wrong. And what could be wrong is bone out of place, pinching a nerve, or irritating a nerve. And if it's the ribs, it can mean breathing. And if you don't breathe rock properly, you can't get the oxygen up to your brain. Your brain is missing one of those three things. Got it so far? How does the blood, blood uh, how does the oxygen get to the brain? Blood vessels. So we got to make sure our blood vessels are working. You have blood vessels here. What are these called? The big arteries. They're the carotid, carotid arteries. How about the ones in the back of the neck? You don't know about those. They actually go up in between the bones. 
There's little holes on either side of your cervical vertebrae and there's an artery that runs through it called the basovertebral artery. So now we have, in computer terms, redundancy. In case this one gets blocked or cut, you got some other ones going to your brain. Can't live without a brain. And so nature has said we're going to get redundancy in there to get circulation all the way up into the brain the right way. So we can have clogged arteries, right? What can cause clogged arteries? Cholesterol, diet, bad, right, bad diet, exactly. And I can't tell you how many patients we see in our office. Our office is about three minutes from here. When I take an x-ray, how many times we see clogged arteries on the x-rays? I would say I'm guessing one out of three. And that's probably being very liberal. It's more like probably 50 percent. <coughs> and when you see it, I point it out to the patients, and I say this is chemical. Remember mechanical and chemical? Chemical is what you're eating. So if you're eating bad food, it can get into the blood vessels, and it can oxidize, essentially, or stick to the artery walls, and now you have a problem. Now, when it comes to cholesterol, this is a big controversy right now in the healthcare field. A lot of people are coming out, Dr. Sinatra, a cardiologist, and other doctors are saying, high cholesterol is not the cause of heart disease. And in fact, I've done the research myself, and I, I find very few articles that even lean toward high cholesterol being the cause of heart disease. It's not the cholesterol floating around in the blood that's dangerous. It's the cholesterol stuck to the artery walls. So if you have a sore pipe, and everything is flowing smoothly through your sore pipe, it's not a problem, right? It's when the sore pipe gets clogged up, that's when you have a problem. Same thing with your blood vessels. So if your blood vessels are clogged up because the cholesterol is sticking to the artery walls, now we have a problem. So when you get your blood work done, this affects blood supply to the brain and mental health, a couple of things I want you to get checked that may not be on your list. Okay, vitamin D. Every cell in your body has a vitamin D receptor site. That means it needs vitamin D. We don't know why. We know why some cells do, but we don't know why every cell does, but you have to have your vitamin D checked. Almost everyone is vitamin D deficient. Very rarely do I find someone has good vitamin D levels, unless they work out sun. Okay? Now in winter, now as the sun is changing its angle, the UVB rays are hitting the earth on a different angle. It's not going to interact with cholesterol to create vitamin D. You know, we say sunlight gives you, gives you vitamin D. It's interacting with cholesterol to convert through several steps to create vitamin D. So you need cholesterol. So don't think cholesterol is bad. Cholesterol is good. Too much of it is a problem. It means your liver isn't working properly. So check your vitamin D. I also want you to check something called homocysteine. Homocysteine will determine how much cholesterol is stuck to the artery walls. So the total cholesterol, that's all well and good. That's fine. But you don't know how much is stuck. And that's the problem. So look for the homocysteine levels as well. Okay, two little fun things not every doctor checks for. Good idea you ask for. And if it's low, but the homocysteine is high, you gotta fix it. Well, how do you fix it? You diet. Something that will prevent homocysteine from forming is B vitamins, specifically, specifically vitamin B6. So that's why it's good to make sure you're getting good cross-section of B vitamins in your diet. So you have to get good circulation. So what else can improve oxygen flow to the brain? Good circulation, what would open up blood vessels? What are some things that might open up or vasodilate blood vessels? Hot peppers. Spicy food. I had some real good Indian food last night. Spicy food opens up the blood vessels and increases circulation through your whole body, which is important. If you ever watch any sporting events, we've got kids here, I'll keep it clean. Every third commercial is for a little blue pill, right? Apparently every man, every man in America is not functioning. <laughs> and every man needs a little blue pill. It must be, it's on TV. And what that does, it opens up your blood vessels. It simulates something called nitric oxide. <coughs> nitric oxide opens up your blood vessels. Hot peppers open up your blood vessel. The soup, Lori and Sharon are serving it today, have ginger in it. Ginger opens up your blood vessels and is an anti-inflammatory. And now the new thing on the market. And this is kind of cool. I've known about this for years. But a friend of mine is the uh, nutritionist for uh, the skaters, the Olympic skaters and the Falcons. And he says the new buzz among athletes, and again, I've been preaching this for years, is beets. Oh, yeah. Beets have beet juice in it. No, beets have nitrates in it. Nit nitrites, nitrates. And nitrates, when they get into the body, convert into nitric oxide and open up your blood vessels. So athletes are using this because it, it, you can test for it. It's not a steroid, it's not illegal, 
And so they're sucking down beet juice like crazy for athletic performance. It also works for other performance. <laughs> Kids aren't paying attention to it. Okay, so it also works for men and women, not just men, but women as well, because you have to have good circulation. And so it opens up the blood vessels, increases the circulation throughout the body, and everything starts to work a lot better. So the beet juice, yes ma'am, can I help you? Okay, just come on in. Help you. Just, just, just interrupt, it's okay, good. So, so the nitrates open up the blood vessels and increase circulation. Pretty cool stuff. So when your mother said eat your beets, she knew you should, she didn't know why you should. Now we know why you should. You should be, one of the reasons is, it's iron. Most of you have plenty of iron, by the way. When people say you're anemic, it may not be low iron. You can check your iron levels, but it could be you want to check your red blood cells, because the red blood cells, there's all sorts of different steps along the way that red blood cells are made. You have to have fer iron and ferritin, and ferritin goes into the body and, and it, it converts into erythrocytes. Erythrocytes, if you don't have B vitamins, like B12, you get megaloblastic anemia, which means you have the red blood cells, it's just not carrying oxygen properly. Or you can damage your red blood cells, because the liver isn't working properly. So just because you, have, you're, you're, you say you're anemic, it may not be an iron deficiency. And sometimes iron deficient, if you give somebody iron, it makes it worse. So if you're going to take iron, you want to have it in a, what I would consider the easiest form to digest, which is the plant-based form. There's an argument out there. Heme iron, like heme, hematology, heme comes from what? Blood. So you're eating another animal's blood, if you're into it, and that's one source of iron. I personally rather just get it from the plants. Vitamin C also allows iron absorption. So if you're taking iron without vitamin C, you can't absorb it. Now it starts to get a little complicated, doesn't it? Iron and B12 and megaloblastic anemia and you got to get circulation and nitric oxide. The good news is you don't have to know all this. Your body does. All you got to do is give it all the raw materials to make it work. So circulation is important. Hot peppers work. Water. Most people are dehydrated. You got to drink water. Water thins out the blood and allows circulation, oxygen up into the brain. And remember we said the blood vessels run in between the bones? <coughs> If the bones twist out of place, they can kink the blood vessels. And it puts pressure on the blood vessels, and that can stop the blood flow from being uh, flowing properly. So what we want to do then? Put the bones back in place that are pinching the blood vessels. As a chiropractor, people always think, well, Joe, you fix pinched nerves. Yeah, we're really good at that. My team of doctors and I, we're like, awesome. But it's a lot more than that. You're also pinching blood vessels that prevent oxygen going to the brain. So we have to have oxygen for the brain to work properly, right? Stimulation. How can the brain get stimulated? Right now, your brain is getting stimulated. I'm giving you information you've never heard before, and your brain is getting it in and going, where do we put this? Where do we store this? This is really good stuff. I gotta try to remember this. And that's stimulation for the brain. Now, exercise is great, because that stimulates the brain as well, but just listening to this lecture is stimulating your brain and helping the brain function more efficiently. What else, what else how else can we stimulate the brain? Music. What? Music. Music will stimulate the brain, exactly. Okay, human touch. We've done, that. well, we, somebody's done studies on monkeys, and if they put them in a cage and don't touch them, they die. You have to have human contact in order for the brain to work normally. Most wacky people you've ever met, I shouldn't say that, that's not nice, most people with uh, emotional issues, I've met some wacky ones too, but you'll find that they don't ha really have a lot of social connections. Kind of loners, they're kind of out there. And one of the reasons is, when you have social connections, it helps the brain work more efficiently. So not just, not oral, but, but physical touch is important as well. And that's why in my practice, our practice, uh, a lot of people come to us, and when seniors come to us, uh, many times I'll talk to them and I'll say, what's your life like? Nobody in my life. I sit home all day. And so they come to our office, we actually touch them. We adjust them, we put our hands on them, and that alone is healing. That stimulates the body just by laying the hands on, and then we put the bones back in place, which of course unpinches the nerves of the blood vessels. So it's really important that you have social contact. And if you don't, I mean, with the internet now, it's very easy. You can go into meetup groups and socializing groups, and what do you like? There's some type of meetup group somewhere that does what you like. Go out and do it. Come to my lectures. We do it once a month at least. So you have to have stimulation. And you know, you hear it say, well, you could do uh, like a Sudoku or you could do uh, crossword puzzles. That's great, but we can go way beyond that. 
That's like amateur stuff. We want to go way beyond that into the major league. Stuff like this is major league stuff. Okay. So the brain has to have stimulation. So staying in motion is vital. Because when you're in motion, it takes a lot of nerves to make me stand up straight. I have nerves called proprioceptive fibers, and they're in my hips, and they're in my jaw, and they're in every, I guess every joint in the body has one. And proprioception tells me where I am in space. So I can close my eyes, and I can touch my foot, I can touch my head, I know the counter's right here. I know where things are, because I know where I am in space, because my proprioceptive system is working. I don't fall over. Now, if you've seen people that fall over, many times it's a proprioceptive issue. And it could be a damage to the jaw, because you have a lot of what's called proprioceptive fibers in your jaw. Why? You don't see yourself chew. You have to know where the food is, where your tongue is, where your cheeks are. And so you have a lot of proprioception in the jaw and a lot of proprioceptive fibers in what's called the sacroiliac joint so that you don't have to do this when you walk. And so by stimulating the proprioceptive fibers, you're stimulating the brain. And that's helping with mental health. Get out and do something. When you're depressed, do you want to get out and do something? No, you want to stay at home. You want to stare at the walls. And one of the things to get over that is to get out and move. Hiking is great. And the reason I like hiking is because, you, if you, especially on uneven surfaces, like on, 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 on trails, not necessarily pavement, because then you're putting more neurological impulses up into your brain trying to keep your balance, walking over root uh, stumps and things like that. So that's kind of nice to keep your body in balance. So that's a great thing to do when you're not feeling well, is to stimulate the proprioceptive fibers and stimulating the brain. And then nutrition. You know, I wouldn't let you out with nutrition. I know you're here for that. So nutrition is key. What are the, any, you should know, if you listen to me before, what are the seven foods you don't want to eat? Seven deadly sins. Do you remember them? Yeah. Go ahead. Alcohol, meat, dairy, sugar, coffee, soda, artificial sweetener. Yeah, alcohol, <laughs> meat, sugar, dairy, coffee, soda, and artificial sweetener. You get the prize. Yeah. Whatever that is. Okay. <laughs> it's a surprise for later. Yeah, keep your brain thinking yeah. about it. So. so alcohol, meat, sugar, dairy, coffee, soda, and artificial sweetener. Those are the seven foods that when you're feeling depressed, you want to eat all the time. Those are the seven foods you shouldn't be eating. Because those are the ones that are going to cause problems and damage to the brain. Of the seven, when it comes to mental health, what do you think is the worst? Sure. Sugar. Sugar, close. Artificial, Artificial, Artificial sweetener. sweetener. Artificial sweetener is the worst, especially aspartame. Aspartame breaks down to three components. Aspartic acid, which is an excitotoxin to the brain. What that does is it causes the brain to fire faster than it's supposed to and excites the brain. And literally burns out your brain cells. So, aspartic acid, phenylalanine can affect your kidneys. That's why if you ever read the label, it says, not for people with phenylketonuria. You don't know what phenylketonuria is. The kidneys can't process phenylalanine. Very serious condition, you could die from it. And then methyl esters. Methyl esters in the body converts to methanol. Methanol is alcohol. It's wood alcohol. Now, if I was gonna give you a glass of wood alcohol and say, here, drink this, is that a good thing? No. no. It's a highly toxic poison, you could probably have me arrested for attempted murder. And yet, it converts in small amounts into methanol. Methanol converts into, methyl acid converts to methanol. Methanol converts into formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is what? <laughs> body fluids. <laughs> we put it in bodies so that the body doesn't rot. Not a good idea to put in your brain. It's a class A carcinogenic, meaning it's the top, top of the list. And then formaldehyde converts to fomic acid. Fomic acid is an poison. Wow. Okay. So of the of the of the ones that are out there, that's the worst one. Now, we are finding that number two is going to be, I'm going to guess, it is sugar. And the reason is this. This is where everybody, the other you know, stuff is all fun and scientific. This is going to hit you because all of you eat too much sugar. Okay. And here's your experiment. <laughs> Lori's giving you an experiment. And I'm doing this for a reason. When you eat this, in about five or ten minutes, I want you to think about what you want to eat. What are you going to want more of? Sugar. So I want to do it to prove to you I'm right. Okay, these are good. These, if you're going to eat sugar, this is gluten-free, wheat-free, flavor-free, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I saw a picture, it was funny, they said, I finally made it the perfect gluten-free, vegan, uh, dairy-free, meat-free meal, and it was a plate of ice cubes. <laughs> <laughs> so, the re now, what's going to happen is, I'm giving you this, because what this is going to do, this sugar, and it tastes good, is going to stimulate your pleasure centers in your brain. <coughs> when those pleasure centers light up, baby, you want more. 
Okay. Okay. Not a summer. More, more, more. Who did that song? Is that fun? Who was it? I was old enough to remember that. This go? A while ago. A while ago. Okay. I wasn't around. <laughs> My disco days. So, so, stimulate the pleasure centers in the brain, logic goes out the window. Logic goes out the window. Anybody ever done something stupid in the name of pleasure? Don't raise your hands. Okay. <laughs> We've all done something stupid in, the, in, in seeking pleasure. And why? Because the pleasure centers override the logic centers in the brain. The prefrontal cortex is the part of your brain that gives you logic. Okay. So, sugar, when you're depressed, is the one thing you want to eat. I want to have cookies. I want, what's that word? The comfort food? You ever hear that one? Yeah. Comfort food means poison. Okay. That's my, that's my translation for you. Because comfort food stimulates the pleasure centers in the brain, and for a moment you get pleasure. And you go, oh, I felt a little better after that. Some people drink, and some people gamble, some people eat, eat foods. I got a little bit of pleasure. Well, that crashes real fast, and then what do you want more of? Whatever that thing is that gave you pleasure, and we call, and then it starts affecting your life adversely, and we call that an uh, addiction. addiction. There you go. That's the definition of addiction. Anything that adversely affects your life, that you, have to, that you want to do over and over again, that has an adverse effect on your life, that's an addiction. And so sugar is very addicting. Okay? Coffee is probably the number one legal drug in the world. Because how many people drink coffee? About 70 or 80 percent of you. Somebody just sent me an article today, a friend of mine up in New York. And he said, hey Joe, a long time no see. It's a friend of mine from, uh, I knew him out from out in California. And he said, um, he said, my brother-in-law sent me this article saying essentially that if you drink coffee, you have lower risk of liver cancer. Uh, and it doesn't affect your heart. And so people should drink coffee. What's your counter? So I gave my counterpoint. Counterpoint is that when you eat coffee, drink coffee, it's such a highly toxic poison that your liver has to quickly detoxify it. And it causes the liver to act in, in, in overload, supercharge the liver. And I believe it causes the liver to detoxify very quickly. Because it gets the coffee out, gets everything else out too. So it actually cleans out your liver. So in a short dose, it's probably not a bad thing. How many people do a short dose of coffee? One, two, two. <laughs> what, is what, is short, what is a short dose? Well, I mean, that actually the ultimate, if you want to clean out your body, there's, there's something called the coffee enema. Yes, this is true. Okay? <laughs> Not kidding. Because there have been studies to help get the liver and the gallbladder to clean themselves out. And when you drink it, it causes the liver to detoxify. But when you don't drink it, it, uh, it causes the gallbladder to contract very hard. And so the gallbladder squirts out its contents, and many times the gallbladder gets sludged up. They call it sludge. Just a lot of junk, a lot of bile salts and everything kind of build up in the gallbladder, and by doing coffee enemas, it can cause the gallbladder to contract very hard and clean it out. Now, gotta give you a disclaimer on that. If you're gonna do it, talk to your doctor first. Okay, if you have gallbladder problems and your gallbladder is damaged, or sometimes it actually starts to rot, don't do this, okay? But coffee also is, uh, depending on the study you read, the most highly sprayed food on the market. When I say sprayed, sprayed with what? Pesticides, herbicides, chemicals, right. So you're drinking a ton of chemicals when you do that. Coffee's an acid. When you put acid in your body, your body has to neutralize the acid. The body uses calcium as its primary neutralizing agent. So when you're drinking coffee, you're sucking calcium out of your bones to neutralize the coffee. Enough, want more? <laughs> more reasons not to drink coffee? So if you're gonna drink coffee, don't. But if you do, don't. But if you still do, organic, organic only. Can we negotiate on that? Cut me a deal on that one? Yeah. You can buy organic coffee anyway. Okay? Uh, and if organic decaffeinated is even better than regular. Okay? Because what happens with coffee is coffee gives you what? Caffeine gives you energy, right? That's why you drink it. Okay? So what happens is it doesn't give you energy. There's a chemical released in your brain called adenosin. Adenosin is released, gets absorbed by adenosin receptor sites, and, it's, and it makes you tired. So when you start getting tired, your body is absorbing adenosin that's getting you tired. Your body's saying, hey, get tired, it's time to rest. Coffee or caffeine blocks the adenosin receptor sites so the adenosin can't be absorbed. And so you don't, it doesn't give you energy, it stops you from getting tired. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So then what happens is your brain is smarter than you. And your brain says, I gotta rest. That's how I recharge. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna create more adenosine receptor sites to absorb more adenosine. Following? And then what do you need? More 
of coffee. There you go. When one cup of coffee blocked up your denison receptor sites, you'd make more than 82 cups, three cups, four cups. Anybody? 10, 12 cups? You know somebody like that, not you. So coffee doesn't give you energy, it robs your body of energy. That's when you come off the coffee, you stop drinking it, your brain goes, ow! You get headaches, right? That's why I recommend weaning yourself off the coffee. In my first book here, Eating Right for the Health of It, it's me with hair. Uh, first half of the book tells you how to change your diet, second half of the book is 200 and some odd recipes. A lot of things that Lori makes here are in this book. Okay. Uh, great guide, everybody should have a copy or two. Uh, there is one rule, I'll autograph it for you, I don't want to see it sold on eBay. Okay? $85 they sell for autographed on eBay. I don't want anybody buying a case of these, alright? <laughs> Christmas money. <laughs> but there's a chapter in here I have on caffeine, it's called Kicking the Habit. And if you're going to come off caffeine from the Denison receptor reaction, is you drink maybe a tablespoon of coffee every hour. And that'll just give you enough to get you down and kind of get the brain to reboot itself. Okay. So coffee, when we're, if, when we're having a, a, a mental crisis, I think, well, I have a little coffee, I feel a little better. But in reality, it's only treating the symptoms. Now, is it okay to treat the symptoms? Sometimes it is, yes. But understand what's happening. I'm drinking this to give me temporary override of the depression or the anxiety or whatever it is, but I really have to get to the cause. And the sugar is really bad. Let's go back to sugar now. When you eat sugar, your pancreas releases something called insulin. You've heard that word? Insulin is released, it takes the sugar, brings it to the cells, and the cells utilize the glucose as fuel. That's good. That's normal. That's the way it's supposed to happen. With diabetics, type 2 diabetics, your body's producing insulin. It's taking the sugar to the cells, but the cells can't take any more sugar. Why? Because you ate too much sugar. And the cells say, I can't take any more sugar. It's going to gunk up, gunk up the works. So if the cells get gunked up, they can't work. So the cells say, stop bringing me sugar. And they become resistant <coughs> to the sugar. So type 2 diabetes is also called insulin resistance. Oh, how's that for being cool? So you can't be doing the sugar because it can release the too much insulin. Now, I did a radio show a couple weeks ago. If you heard it, it was on blood pressure. And I talked about how salt is bad. And now we're finding what's worse than salt for blood pressure. Sure. Sugar. Several reasons. When you release insulin, Insulin carries a molecule of magnesium with it. Magnesium relaxes your blood vessels, opens them up. Remember vasodilation, nitric oxide, opens up the blood vessels. And so if you're eating a lot of sugar, you're producing a lot of insulin, you're wasting a lot of magnesium, the blood vessels can't relax. Number two, glucose is a type of sugar that's utilized for fuel. If you, glucose, if you eat fructose, the regular table sugar is half fructose, half glucose, if you eat Glucose, fructose, it has to go into the liver and get converted into glucose. Following so far? A little confusing, okay? Fructose, if you have too much of it, converts into nitric oxide, or converts into uric acid, which prevents nitric oxide production. And if you can't produce nitric oxide, what happens? You can't open up the blood vessels. Vasodilation. So when you understand how things work, it's easy to fix. I pay somebody to work on my computers at my office because I don't understand it. They pay me to fix their bodies because they don't understand it, <laughs> okay? But I'm trying to give you an education so that you can take control of your own health in certain areas. So fructose is bad. High fructose corn syrup, worse. What sweetener is worse than high fructose corn syrup when it comes to the uric acid and nitric oxide? Agave okay. nectar. Agave nectar is 85% fructose. High fructose corn syrup is 55% fructose. Agave nectar has more fructose than high fructose corn syrup. Wow. And here we are saying, it's a health food, eat it, it's wonderful. No, way worse than high fructose corn syrup. Ain't that a kick in the head? Okay, and the reason it doesn't spike your blood sugar is because it's fructose. It has to go to the liver first. So the blood sugar stays level, the, fruit, the liver mm, has to do the conversion. <coughs> and that's why it doesn't spike your blood sugar. Wow. <coughs> what the heck was that? <laughs> puberty all of a sudden, right here. Okay. So that's one of the issues. So stay away from sugar. So when it comes to mental health issues, the worst thing you can put in your body is artificial sweetener. Second worst is 
sugar. Worst type of sugar is fructose. So you're starting to see how easy it is to get the brain working again? We have to give it stimulation. Go out and do something physical. That's important. Listen to music while doing something physical, even better. We have to give it oxygen. So if you're having rib pain or neck pain or back pain, mid-back pain especially, it could be bones and ribs out of place. You're not getting proper rib expansion. You're not getting oxygen. And then you have to give it the right food. So now let's, okay, let's talk about the right food. I'm trying to get you out of here in an hour. I know you butts can only handle about an hour of sitting. <laughs> so the right food, what's the right food? It's easy, there's four of them. Fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. That's it. How easy is that? The good news is there's about 120,000 choices when it comes to fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. So people say, but that's so boring. There's nothing to eat. I can't grill that. <laughs> yeah, you can actually you can grill peaches if you want. I don't know why you would. Okay. <laughs> but those are the foods you should make most of your diet consistent. Now, I'm also a realist. I understand you're not going to do everything I say. Very few people do. Or just to start. As time goes on, they become patients, they start following more and more, they start to follow. And they say, you know what, I gave up the sugar and I didn't have my anxiety moods, depression anymore, or my anxiety anymore. Joe was right. You know, I cut out those artificial sodas and my headaches went away and I'm happier and I have more energy. You know, I started drinking more water and I sleep better at night because I'm, I'm more awake during the day. So if you start doing something, you're going to see some changes. Okay, so let's go back to mechanics again. Your diaphragm sits here, goes up and down. There's something underneath your diaphragm right here. What's this organ right here? Any idea? Stomach. Stomach sits right here. So you swallow food, goes down your throat, a little hole in your a diaphragm called the esophageal sphincter, lower esophageal sphincter. Esophageal sphincter opens up and drops food into your stomach and your esophageal sphincter closes and then your stomach digests food and passes it on to the small intestine. A lot of people, when I say a lot, I mean a lot, because I'd say about 85% of my patients have this, I have it, the stomach pushes up against the diaphragm. So when the stomach pushes up against the diaphragm, the diaphragm can't mechanically drop down because the stomach is pushing up. And so you have trouble getting a, a deep breath. So a lot of times when you have anxiety, it's because you're not getting enough oxygen and the body is saying, hey, Something's wrong. We're not getting enough oxygen. I'm going to get you anxious so you start paying attention to me. That's what anxiety is, right? Something's wrong. And so many times the stomach is up against the diaphragm, not allowing the diaphragm to drop down. If the stomach's up against the diaphragm, what might be some symptoms? Burping, gas, bloating, acid reflux, trouble swallowing, sore throat. What if you have a chronic sore throat, chronic cough? Could be acid reflux coming up and acid coming up into your throat burning your esophagus. Too much acid in the esophagus can lead to something called esophageal cancer. Acid eats away at the cells, the cells can't replicate fast enough, they replicate abnormally, and we have something called esophageal cancer. Common? Yeah. Why? Acid into the, into the gut. Now, what can we do? Let's talk about a couple of things we can do. Well, let me finish why this is bad. Remind me to talk about what you can do. So, when you eat proteins, and you just had some protein, Everything has protein in it. I think water is the only thing that doesn't have protein in it. So you ate some food, has protein in it, goes into your stomach, your stomach has acid, has hydrochloric acid, pepsin, pepsinogen, and it dissolves the proteins into something called amino acids. The amino acids then get, go to the liver, get reassembled, and go out into the body. And for example, tryptophan becomes 5-HTP, which becomes serotonin. Now this is where the physical affects the mental. You need serotonin as a neurotransmitter to help you calm down and focus. So if you have anxiety, depression, ADD, ADHD, we use something called serotonin reuptake inhibitors. SSRIs, anybody hear those? I won't give you the brand names because we're recording this. And serotonin reuptake inhibitors, essentially, and this is really a simplistic way of putting it, it helps you utilize a little bit of serotonin that you have. What if we make more serotonin? Well, there's a novel idea, isn't it? How do we make serotonin? Got to have the raw materials. What are the raw materials? Amino acids. Tryptophan. Tryptophan combines with vitamin B6. Remember B vitamins? We talked about those earlier. Vitamin B6 and tryptophan create something called 5 HTP. 5 HTP becomes serotonin. You're able to focus, calm down, and be happy again. Serotonin becomes melatonin. Melatonin helps you what? 
sleep. 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 How many people with anxiety and depression have trouble? Sleep. Now you know why. See how easy that was? You know more than most neurologists right now when it comes to neurotransmitters. No, that's not true. Neurologists are brilliant. Okay, a lot of them listen to my show and call me up and say, wow, you're right. I never thought about that before. Wow, I never put it all together in that simple, you know, chain of events. I said, good, send me your patients. I'll fix, I'll give them back when I'm done. So, <laughs> I'll send it back when I'm done. Tyrosine becomes dopamine. Remember dopamine? We didn't talk about dopamine. Dopamine gives you what? Pleasure. Remember pleasure centers in your brain? Like sugar stimulating those dopamine receptor sites and give you real happy highs? So if you can't digest your food, A, you're not going to feel very good, and B, many times you can't experience pleasure. So you go out and do something crazy trying to get more dopamine receptors stimulated. Gosh, I used to love dancing, but I'm going to go out and dance harder. I'm just not getting the pleasure out of it anymore. So what am I going to do? I'm going to do caffeine to try to stay awake. Maybe drugs to try to stay awake, to give me more energy. I'm going to go out and seek. I'm going to, that's what addiction becomes now. I'm going to try to do something to stimulate the pleasure centers in my brain, and I'm going to throw logic out the window. And so if we have a normally functioning digestive system, we can utilize it. Now, here's the kicker. Serotonin is important for your brain, but there's a problem. Only 5% of the serotonin in your body is used in your brain. 95% is used in your digestive system. So the digestive system has to be working properly in order for the brain to work properly because they're fighting for the same stuff. And you gotta have enough stuff to go around. So if you don't, if you have leaky gut syndrome, you know what that is? I got time, okay. Your gut, small intestine, large intestine. You eat food, goes from your stomach into your small intestine, and it gets absorbed. Now, some parts of your small intestine are only one cell thick. One cell thick. And you're eating things like gluten. Gluten is a protein. Gets into your body, the immune system says, I don't know what that protein is, I don't recognize it, I'm going to attack it. And when it attacks it, it can attack the colon as well. The gut, because many cells in the gut look like gluten. It's a similar protein. And it eats away at its own gut. And now you get little holes in your gut. And through these holes, essentially big chunks of food can be absorbed. And big chunks of food get absorbed, get into the body, the immune system doesn't know what this foreign protein is in the blood system and attacks it, and you create an autoimmune reaction. And other autoimmune reactions could be what? Thyroid disease. Anything else? Lupus. MS. MS. All right. Rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. So your body's attacking itself. Why is it attacking itself? Many times when you put something in there, the body didn't recognize it attacked it. It looks like the body, and the body starts attacking itself. And that inflammation now becomes systemic, which means it goes through your whole system. And it can get into the brain and cause inflammation of the brain, which oftentimes is a mental disorder. It causes a mental disorder. And so what you're eating is having a direct impact, chemically and physically, on your emotions. Because all we are is a sack of chemicals. That's it. What's death? We stop processing chemicals. All the chemicals are still there. If I were to die right now, everything in my body, carbon, magnesium, uh, sodium, boron, silica, it'd all still be here. Why am I dead? I'm not processing it anymore. So all the chemicals are there, and we have to process those chemicals. And when you're not allowing your body to process that sack of chemicals that you call a body, that's when we start having problems. So all you are is a sack of chemicals. <laughs> Flush bag, right? So, and so you have to put the right chemicals in. You have to have the proper neurology, the nervous system, the brain and the body talking to each other to process those chemicals, convert them into things like neurotransmitters, eye tissue, hair, toenails, earwax. And then you have to be able to excrete and detoxify and get the junk out. And when you put more junk in than your body can get out, now we have a toxic overload and we have a problem. And the liver is the main place that detoxification occurs and the liver does its best and when it gets overloaded, it just says, I can't do this anymore. And then you get fatty liver, body starts to store those toxins in fat cells in the liver. Now circulation gets blocked through the liver. You don't get good circulation, can't get oxygen to the brain. Remember oxygen stimulation and nutrition is what your brain needs. And now we've got a problem. So dealing with mental health can be mechanical and chemical. 
and physical. And you gotta address all three, because if you don't, you're not gonna get over it. Now, sometimes there's what we call limitation of matter. What that means is the brain just isn't gonna work, but we want the brain working to the best it can. One of my secretaries has Down syndrome. She's been with me 11 years. We got an award last year as the number one employer in Cobb County for hiring a handicap. And when I went to receive the award, I wanted so bad to say, I didn't hire her because she's handicapped. I hired her because she works. The only reason I hired her, she works, she does her job. That's all I, I, all I could ever ask an employee to do is do their job. And so Kelly's been with us now, she loves when I talk about her. So, 11 years. Now she has Down syndrome, something called trisomy 21. And her 21st place in the gene, there's, 21, there's several places, but the 21st place in her gene has three instead of two. And when you have three, trisomy 21. At the 21st place, there's three genes. We can change her chemistry all day, and we have. And at 40 years old, she's getting better, not worse. So there's a limitation of matter there. Her genes are not normal. I hate to say that word for her. But because we have her getting chiropractic care, because she's mentally stimulating her brain, she's a file clerk. And when something goes wrong, Kelly, can't find this file. You people. <laughs> and she'll go find that file. <laughs> and we make fun of her, we tease her, we play with her. But her parents and her coaches have come to us and said, if it wasn't for this job, she'd probably be dead. And now she's not decreasing, she's increasing her mental capacity at 40 years old. What are we giving her? We're giving her oxygen, she's moving, stimulation, because she's thinking, and nutrition. So even in cases where there's limitation of matter, like in Kelly's case, we see dramatic improvements in mental function. So it can happen, you're causing most of it though. Now if somebody dies, you didn't cause that. You're depressed, you should be depressed, you're human. It's a human emotion, that's good. But understand the steps you need to take to get over it and process. Okay, you have to grieve, but then you have to come out of the grief as well. Okay, we can give you a whole lecture on grief, E. Kubler-Ross's research, right? She wrote a book called On Death and Dying, and she talked about the five stages of loss, and it's, it's pretty powerful stuff. And when you realize I'm in this stage, okay, I'm in denial. It didn't happen. They're not dead. Okay, anger. I'm mad that they died. Uh, was it debating? Uh, negotiating. God, if you could just get rid of this pain, I'll do whatever you want me to. Depression, and then acceptance. So there's five stages of loss that E. Kubler Ross wrote about 40 years ago, 30 years ago, I don't even know when she wrote it. But when you understand, again, if you understand how things work, it's easy to fix. I'm in a state of depression right now because I lost my sister. That's okay. But then you gotta go to the next step. I'm in an anger because I lost my sister. That's okay. Let's, we understand what the next step is and go through it. And when you understand how the brain works, oxygen stimulation and nutrition, you can get the brain working again. And when you're depressed, you don't want to do that. You want to sit around and eat cookies and sit around your own knees and not shave and watch TV, right? <laughs> but this is where you come in. When you're depressed, somebody may have to help you. But when somebody else is having emotional issues, you're going to have to help them. Because now, in your one hour training, <laughs> you have tools that you didn't have before you walked through this door. And one of the things I believe we have to do is you now have to go utilize these tools for other people. You know what, Tom? I know you're in a bad mood. I know you're depressed. You know what, Bob? I'm really sorry about your loss. You lost your job, whatever. I get that. Let's go out for a hike. Last thing I want to do is go for a hike. I get that. Let's go out for a hike, though. And don't take them out for ice cream after the hike. Okay? <laughs> You know what, Barbara? I understand you're really down and out. Let's go ahead and come over to my house. I'm going to make a big salad. I don't feel like coming out. Good, I'll bring it to your house. Okay? And it's okay. So you want need to utilize these tools and understand. I mean, I always feel it's our duty as humans to take care of each other. You know? I, had, I, I, left, I was driving over here and I saw somebody who says uh, uh, a quote from the Bible about men have to take care of their animals. I forget what, what, what verse it was. And I thought to myself, I wonder if he's vegetarian. Because if he's not, shame on him. <laughs> so, but just a thought I had. So take this knowledge and use it for yourself. But if you're having back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, the nervous system is not getting the messages from the body to the brain and from the brain to the body. 
So you're physically blocking stimulation of the brain. So you think, I've got neck pain, I've got shoulder pain, I've got hip pain, my feet are numb. I think we're blocking messages from the brain to the body, and pain is the warning sign telling you something's wrong. To ignore it is a very dangerous thing. Pain is there telling you something's wrong. If the fire alarm went off right now, you would know one thing, get out, right? You understand the fire alarm is a warning sign telling you something's wrong. Fix it, how do you fix it? Get out. And yet when we have pain, for some reason we don't think that. Think of a pain as a fire alarm. If you're having pain, something's wrong. And you better fix it, because if you don't, you're gonna get burned. You're gonna have problems. So pain can be good, because it's telling you something's wrong. So don't think pain is bad, pain's good. And so if you wanna get that fixed, we'd love to have you come in and we'll check it out and find out what's causing the pain. If you're having acid reflux, burping, gas, bloating, bloating trouble swallowing, chronic cough, could be acid reflux, I would say 85% of my patients have this. There are days where I'll see every patient and every one of them will have something in the digestive system where I have to fix. Isn't that crazy? So don't think that that's a good thing or something to be ignored if you're having the acid reflux and the burping and the gas and the trouble swallowing. Come in and get it fixed. And many times we just need to pull the stomach away from the diaphragm. When we pull the stomach away from the diaphragm, it comes out of spasm, so now it can break the proteins into amino acids. Amino acids can become neurotransmitters and help the brain work again. Following all that, and so you have to have stimulation, oxygen, nutrition. If you have pinched nerves, you gotta get it fixed. If you have having acid reflux, you gotta get it fixed. And you have to stop eating bad food. Is it hard to do? Yeah. Is it worth it? Yeah. Yeah. It really is. I've been a vegan for over 30 years now. I'm not asking you to be a vegan. I know three other vegans. Okay? I know three other vegans in my whole life. If I only hung out with vegans, I'd have no friends. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't judge. And many of my friends, who have at least, at least given up on meats and dairy products sometimes, they'll say, you know, I've known you for 15 years. Not once have you ever lectured me on what I eat. And I understand what you're saying now. So my actions are more powerful than me yelling at them. So I don't want to lose a friend over it. And so they'll come around. And you can do the same thing. So especially with the holidays coming, Couple of tricks I'll give you as we wrap up here. Couple of tricks with the holidays. Number one, never go to a party hungry. Because what are you gonna do? Eat bad food. How often? 100% of the time, okay? So never go to a party hungry. Some things you can eat before you go to a party. Something heavy and protein filled like chickpeas, lentils. Right now at my house I'm making split pea soup. I got a crock pot, I'm making split pea soup. Okay, those are nice things to have around. Eat that before you go to the party. Then you can go to the party and have fun and not be so worried about what's the food, what's to eat, what's the, what did they bring? Is that okay? If you don't know what to bring to the party, get a copy of my book. Plenty of recipes in there. Okay, so what to eat and, and what to bring to parties. Good so far? Not bad, huh? Keep an eye on that clock for you. Okay, questions. Go ahead, your turn. Yes. How do we know off sugar? Yeah, you gotta stop eating sugar. <laughs> it's tough, it really is tough, but I'm gonna give you a little trick here. When you want something sweet, you try to stimulate the pleasure centers in your brain. So what other ways can we stimulate pleasure centers in your brain? You can talk to a friend, okay? Exercise is great. These things, I mean, it's like work with Alcoholics Anonymous, right? What do you do? I'm having an attack, call up my sponsor. Dude, I need wine. <laughs> no, you don't, calm down, let's go out. So that same thing works, okay? Phone a friend type thing, get a sponsor. <laughs> we should start a little of vegan AA or something. SA, Sugar's Anonymous, okay? <laughs> um, and then you have to make sure that you're full. Because when your body is full and with fiber in it, fiber slowly pushes the sugar through the colon and gives you a slow release of sugar. When your body starts to crash, you want to expect pickup. What do you want? Sugar. And here's the kicker. This is my secret. I'll tell you about it. Us. Don't let it, don't, they can't listen. Get it out of the house. Because yeah. if it's in the house, you're going to eat it. I don't care who you are. Okay? What is it? Larry Campbell, guys? I don't care who you are. That's funny, right? I don't care who you are, you're going to eat it. It's in my house. I'll tell you a little story. A couple years ago, a patient brought me chocolate chip cookies, vegan, gluten free. <laughs> <laughs> they were heaven. And so I had it in my pantry. I'm sitting there watching TV, and I heard the voice. You know the voice, right? Joey, I'm here, eat me. Right? No, 
I'm not going to do it. Yeah, Joey. I took the cookies, swear my father's grave, took the cookies, went out of my back porch, and threw them into a stream. Because if they were there, I was going to eat them. And I don't know if you're like me, but I think this. If I eat them, then they're not here anymore. No. <laughs> right? <laughs> Anybody think that aside from me? <laughs> if I eat them, they're not here, then I can't eat them. <laughs> You've got to get them out of the house. Because as soon as they're in the house, you're going to eat them. Stevia is also very good for that. Get, make yourself a cup of tea, add some stevia to it. Now there's different types of stevia. Um, you want to try to get the pure stevia. They sell it here in bulk. It's about $78 a pound. <coughs> You're not going to use a pound in a lifetime, okay? Put a little bag, about that much in a bag, take a, like a fingernail full. Pure stevia is about 300 times sweeter than sugar. So that's the kind I use, okay? Uh, it's a lot cheaper that way too without the packages and the maltodextrin, which is a, a, a cut, something that cuts it. Uh, but Stevie will help you with your sugar craving, get out of the house, get us out of the house, and then get you out of the house. And that's how you get over your sugar craving. It takes about four or five days. But the problem is as soon as you drink again, or as soon as you eat sugar again, you're off the wagon. Just like with AA. You can't drink. Once you drink, you lose all your chips, you start over again. So don't eat the sugar, and that's why going to parties is real dangerous. And that's why a lot of depression occurs during the holidays. You're not getting the vitamin D. Take 5,000 international units of vitamin D. Get your vitamin D checked, but generally speaking, I take 5,000 units a day. Take the vitamin D. Get the exercise. You've got to get that vitamin D in your body. Drink a lot of water. It's dry in the winter. Your body's going to dry out. And try to have a lot of contact with friends. Don't sit home with bad food. Because that's why a lot of depression occurs. You eat the sugar, you get a high, you crash, you crash, you don't want to socialize, you don't want to socialize, your brain isn't getting stimulation. Do you say sugar gives me a little high, I'm gonna eat more high. You see how you get caught in that, that little loop right there? Real easy. And when I say sugar, that's breads, cookies, cakes, donuts, and pastas. Not just sugar. So get the bread out of the house. I'm Italian, it's hard for me to say that. Okay, more questions? Yes? What do you think about probiotics? Probiotics are great. Yes, so is provolone. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> um, probiotics are great. In your call, right now in your body, 99% of all your DNA is bacteria. You're 1% human, 99% bacteria. How's that for a blowhead to your ego, huh? You're basically life support for bacteria. Probiotics, pro means what? In favor of, right? Probiotic, biotic means life. It's in favor of life. They're good bacteria. And so I think you should be taking good bacteria on a daily basis. I do. It's strange. I'm going to tell you. Oh, you got an essential source back there? No? I got two supermarines. Okay. Um, years ago, somebody came to me and said, Dr. Joe, what would be the perfect supplement? I said, if somebody could take raw fruits and vegetables and put them in a pill, wouldn't that be easy? Don't have to worry about it going bad. Didn't have to worry about it if there's pesticides in it. Raw fruits and vegetables in a pill would be great. So I created something called supergreens, an essential source, Dr. Joe's essential source. It's, uh, if you took one scoop of it, it's about 10 servings of raw fruits and vegetables. Then we add probiotics, and I added prebiotics. If you don't know what prebiotics are, prebiotics feed the good bacteria in your colon. Probiotics are the good bacteria. Prebiotics feed the good bacteria, so you get a double whammy. Then I added a complete non-synthetic multivitamin, and I added stevia to sweeten it. So when you get your sugar cravings, take a big scoop of Dr. Joe's essential source. I had it twice today. I had it in the morning when I woke up, had a very busy day today, plus I did yard work today before I came here. And right before I came here, I took Super Greens and Essential Source as well. And had some beets, by the way. So, so that's where I get my probiotics from every single day. And then if you eat a lot of vegetables, vegetables are going to have prebiotics in them as well, as well as probiotics. <coughs> Cabbage is loaded with probiotics. That's why it makes a good sauerkraut. It already has the probiotics in it. Okay? This is Essential Source. This is what I take every single day, and I mix it with Super Greens. Super Greens alkalizes your system because most of us are too acidic. When you alkalize the system with things like wheatgrass, barleygrass, and alfalfa grass, wheatgrass is gluten free. Gluten only occurs when you make the wheat berry. Then I add dulse, which is iodine. Every cell in your body has vitamin D receptor site, every cell in your body has an iodine receptor site. We need iodine, and most of us don't get iodine in our diets. So some of us get zero. So this is going to give you the iodine. Uh, uh, and then we add chlorella and spirulina, which is the purest form of omega-3 fatty acids in the world. The, the good kinds, okay? I take a scoop of this and a scoop of this at least once a day. If I'm going to give a lecture, if I'm doing a radio show, if I'm going on a date, if I'm going to work out, I'll take it a second time. I have some people that work really, really hard. They'll take it six times a day. 
They said, Doc, it's amazing. I'm working hard. I'm feeling great. I go home. I have a life. I don't go fall asleep after work. I said, that's a lot. But they're very depleted in nutrients because their diet is usually fast food and coffee and cigarettes or something like that. So the more depleted you are, the more you need this. But this stuff works great. And it's a great source of probiotics. Everybody should be taking that every day. Yes? But uh, frequent hiccups or more frequent it could be the diaphragmatic spasm. Yeah, it's a diaphragmatic spasm. You also want to check the fourth cervical nerve. The fourth cervical nerve sends out a branch called the phrenic nerve, which goes down into your diaphragm, which makes your diaphragm go up and down. That's why if you're paralyzed below the fourth cervical nerve, you're not on a vent. You don't need assistance. If you fracture at the fourth or above, the brain isn't getting the messages to the diaphragm. Remember stimulation? And you have to be on a ventilator. So if somebody's on a ventilator or not, you can tell what, how, how high up or how low they broke their neck. So, yes. uh, if you wanted to stay away from alkaline foods, what four foods would you say, uh, or fruits and vegetables would you say to stay away from? Stay away from acid foods, you mean? It does, right, exactly, acid. Stay from acid foods. Well, the seven big ones, alcohol, meat, oh, sugar, yeah. fruits and vegetables, you mean? So what would you go to? What would I go to? Celery, spinach, and figs are the most alkaline foods. Okay, those are the four, three most, cel most alkalizing foods to the body. Why? The little minerals. Remember calcium neutralizes acid? Minerals neutralize acid. So the higher mineral content you have, the more neutralization of the acid you'll have. And celery, spinach, and figs are loaded with minerals. Yes? What uh, numbers do you like to see on a blood test for vitamin D and homocysteine? Oh, gosh. I'd have to look that up again. <laughs> Whenever I do blood work, it's always right there. So, yeah. But it'll say normal. Okay. <laughs> so when you get your blood work done, they'll tell you it's in normal range. And I've never seen a blood work not tell you it's normal. Above 30, 30 to 100. Over 100 is toxic. Below, I think it's 30 or it's 35. For vitamin D? Yeah. Yeah. If it's below that, you're deficient. Okay. And most of us are deficient. So I just assume I'm going to take it. You're going to have to take a lot of vitamin D to get over 100. So don't do that. Okay? 5,000 a day is fine though. Would you recommend alkaline water as opposed to other cultured water? Alkaline water. Boy, that's a whole five hour lecture right there. Uh, my thing on alkaline water is this. Yes, you should alkalize your system, but you should also have an alkaline diet so you don't need to alkalize your system. Okay? So, yes. What's the consequence of hyperthyroidism? Or that book is, you may have discussed that. Hyperthyroidism? Wow, that's a whole other lecture in itself. Hyperthyroidism is your body's putting out too much T4. There's four, there's four uh, thyroid hormones, T1, T2, T3, and T4. The number means how many molecules of iodine are attached to it. So if you don't have enough iodine, you can't make the hormones. Too much T4, your body becomes overactive. It's hyper, uh, it, become, it becomes hyper. And that can be very dangerous because you can get rapid heart rate. And one of the conditions, like Graves' disease, hyperthyroidism is that the heart can go into uh, AFib and could actually kill you. So you got to be careful with that with hyperthyroidism. You have to find out what's causing it. Now if it's genetic, sometimes we have to do surgery. I mean it is what it is. It's a genetic cause. Okay, I would say it's caused by the mother, right? It's not, I'm only kidding. <laughs> but hyperthyroidism is the thyroid is pumping out too much T4 and you got to bring that T4 down. There's only two drugs you can give for hyperthyroidism. If your body doesn't respond to either one of those two drugs, the only option is surgery. Okay? You can change the diet, and sometimes that works, but you change the diet, try the two drugs, because the drugs oftentimes will lower the T4, but then also lower your white blood cell count. And then you can go into infection. So you got to play the game, try to do everything you can, last resort is surgery. Okay? More iodine in your system? You need, does it mean you need more iodine? It could mean that you need more iodine, yeah. Sometimes iodine used to be used for hyperthyroidism, but you really got to, it's a little more complicated than that. You got to find out where the breakdown is, so, yes. What, what is ubiquinol? And is that a supplement? Ubiquinol is CoQ10. Is that a supplement? It's a supplement, CoQ10, coenzyme Q10. Every mitochondria, every cell in your body has the mitochondria and needs a ubiquinol. If you're taking cholesterol drugs, cholesterol lowering drugs, the same enzyme that produces cholesterol produces coenzyme Q10 or ubiquinol, same thing. And so if you're taking cholesterol drugs, I recommend you always take ubiquinol with it. Ubiquinol is great. Many times if you're fatigued, you can try taking ubiquinol, and if you're low in that, you can get a burst of energy. You feel great. Because it feeds the cells. It makes the mitochondria produce more energy. So is it a good supplement? It's a good supplement to try. I'm not sure everybody needs it, but okay. you can try it. If you see a positive change with it, you might be okay with it. it it's, it's a safe supplement. Yeah. Okay. okay. More questions? Yes? It is a product um, here that you can buy to help with uh, uh, the constipation. It's, um, it's a bulk product. Spillium, I don't know. Take this. Dr. Joe's intestinal cleanser. I got it all done for you. It's like I set these people up. You know why? I've been lecturing for so long that I know the questions you're going to ask, so I make the supplements for you already. This stuff's amazing. Your bowel should move two to three times a day. Also can affect mental health. Constipation, those toxins get reabsorbed back into the body. So, your bowel should move two to three times a day. Yes, I said a day, not a week. Okay? 
If your bowels aren't moving two to three times a day, you want to check the nerve supply to the digestive system. As a chiropractor, we always think pinch nerves control organs. The stomach may be spasm, pushing up against the diaphragm, slowing down the digestive system. There's a valve called the ileocecal valve right here. If it's stuck closed, you can have constipation. But this is a great little pill, very gentle. Take one, see if it works tomorrow. If it doesn't work, then take two tomorrow. If it doesn't work, take three. Don't take more than three. Trust me. I had a patient take six one. She said, wow, that worked. <laughs> so this stuff is amazing. And then what I want you to do is take it for about three or four weeks and then start cutting back on it. I don't want you to, this stuff you should be taking forever. This stuff I want to get the bowels working and then cut back on it. Okay, so there's your, there's your tensile cleanser. Okay, yes? I wanted to recommend somebody who's been diagnosed with bipolar disorder uh -huh. or schizophrenia, what's the one natural nutritional chiropractic thing that they should do? I would, if you had to pick one thing, I'd say check the stomach. Okay, everybody wants one takeaway, fix the stomach, yeah. Position. Yes, the position. That, I've never had a patient with a mental disorder not have that stomach issue in 30 years of doing this, and I see them every day in practice. People come from all over the world to come see us because I don't know why everybody else doesn't do this, but they do. They don't, so they send them here. Yes? What will be the source, what foods will be the source for iodine? Source of iodine, seaweed is going to be one of the best. Seaweed. That's why I put dults in here, okay? We iodize salt, but that's the wrong kind of iodine. It'll prevent goiter, it'll prevent the thyroid from getting too big, but it's not the good form of iodine. You want the pure, organic form of iodine, and that's why I put this seaweed in here, okay? What else? Yes, sir? What's the mechanism of the connection between ICV issues and anxiety and depression? ICV? Iliocecal valve. Ilio Iliocecal valve. Okay, the ileocecal valve, uh, if it's stuck closed, you know, it's a valve between the small and large intestine. So the food gets digested, it opens up, and the food dumps from the small intestine into the large intestine, the valve closes, food, the water is absorbed, goes out and out, goes, goes up and out. If the ileocecal valve is stuck closed, food can't get through, you have constipation. Constipation is toxins that are being dumped into your small intestine to get out of your system, get reabsorbed, and that can cause a lot of brain fog and depression. If it's stuck open, you have diarrhea, and now you're depleting your body of nutrients and minerals, and so that can affect it as well. So that's why bowels should move smooth, easy, and clean two to three times a day. And if the ileocecal valve is stuck, we've got to get in there and adjust it just like we adjust the spine or the stomach. Okay. Do they carry all your products here? Yes, all the products are here. Okay. Inside too? Inside, yeah. yeah. Okay, so here's the thing. We're going to have presents for you. Mm -hmm. Girls love what? Presents. Presents, nice, yeah. Diamonds. Diamonds, yeah. <laughs> Cut to the chase, right? <laughs> Okay, so here's your homework. You thought the lecture was free. <laughs> it ain't. Oh, that's it. Everybody got a survey? Yeah. Okay. Do me a favor. Fill out the survey. Let me know what you thought of tonight's workshop. Did you like it? Did you not like it? Did you learn something? Hopefully you walked away with a lot of good information. I didn't get into adrenal glands, but again, I can talk for hours on any topic. So, um, Fill out the survey. Now, I'd like to ask you this. Think about your health. Could your health be better than it is right now?